Western civilization. It's not uncommon to see either word in ironic scare quotes. Western civilization. The very concept of Western civilization, however, used to dominate the education and intellectual worlds, but now it's dismissed as passe. At best, the concept seems outmoded or retro. At worst, Western civilization is dismissed as Eurocentric, colonialist, and even ever so slightly racist. After all, who are we to judge our civilization as superior? Everybody in this room has heard the many critics. Western capitalist materialism is inferior to the not West, which is almost uniformly more holistic, earthy, connected to the environment, connected to community, in tune with mother nature, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, we don't have to judge our civilization at all to know that it's appealing. We just need to ask those who have been until the age of mass migration, excluded from Western civilization, and are now clamoring to join it. Even those who stay in their home nations are adopting Western institutions like the rule of law, liberal democracy, religious toleration, and economic freedom. Certainly, the success and the process of that adop adoption varies, and like all historical processes, is uneven. But at no time in history has Western civilization been as dominant as it is in the 21st century. This period of great success for the West has, however, been met with great neglect by intellectuals, academics, and sadly, we're finding even the general public. Courses in Western civilization are rare in universities, and it's rare that you would study the concept of Western Civ. They've been supplanted by courses in world history, which view Europe as nothing more than one civilization among many, and by the inevitable roster of post-colonial studies, which have strongly asserted that the values of Western civilization are anachronistic and culturally biased. One of the purposes of today is to demonstrate that Western civilization is as important an intellectual pursuit than ever. Indeed, the study of the institutions and events that made the West dominant is probably the most important and interesting intellectual pursuit of the 21st century. After all, the best and most effective way to spread economic growth, democracy, and individual liberty is an extremely live question. But we will be unable to answer that question if we refuse to grant its premises that economic growth democracy and individual liberty are actually a good thing at all, and that they have developed in concert in Europe. The vast bulk of the humanities is abandoned discussion of the origins and strength of the West and now focuses on its perceived and admittedly sometimes real flaws. Many of you will have seen the Institute of Public Affairs work on the national curriculum, which found that the hostility to Western civilization which has damaged Australian academia, has now spread to the federal government's proposed secondary school curriculum. Every single Australian student in the country will be taught a curriculum that downplays the role of Christianity in European history, infers that human rights were invented wholesale by the United Nations, blames slavery on the Industrial Revolution, and ignores critical moments in the development of European liberalism like the English Civil War. Instead, students will be told about the 19th century concept of progress, as if there could be nothing more old fashioned than the belief that human activity has made the world better. And they'll be taught that the history of West is characterized primarily by oppression of minorities by a privileged majority, not the slow advance of liberalism, of individual rights, or the fight against tyrannical government. It would be one thing if Australian students were just being taught bad history. It's probably too much to ask schools to teach the best history, but it is much too much to allow them to teach history that is so obviously and unforgivably biased against the very foundations of our society. Now, I probably don't need to convince anybody in this room 
that Western Civ is worthy of study and reflection. And the opposition to Western civilization in our society is absolutely ideological. So we should admit is its defense. The Institute of Public Affairs is a free market think tank. We've had a nearly 70 year record of arguing for economic freedom and individual liberty. Little surprise, we're interested in the origins of those values. But the case I want to make today is that defending Western civilization need not be a political endeavor, except in the broadest sense of the word politics. Let me point you to a magisterial new book by Ricardo Duchesne called The Uniqueness of Western Civilization. Duchesne is no fire-breathing think tank ideologue like myself. I'm glad people laughed. <laughs> He's a professor at the University of New Brunswick, St. John. He studied for his master's under the Marxist historian of the French Revolution, Georges Roudet, and his book was released in February this year. In his book, Duchesne systematically, rigorously, and comprehensively tackles historians who have, over the last half century, sought to downplay and implicitly delegitimize the rise of the West. The great historical question has long been how to account for the remarkable spurt of growth in the West after the 17th and 18th centuries. Economically, after a while, until this period, the uh, 18th century, the West was not particularly unique. At the turn of the first millennium, a European visitor to the Muslim lands would have been impressed, even overawed by Arabic wealth. 500 years later, at the turn of the 16th century, Chinese and British GDP per capita was roughly the same. But during the 18th and 19th centuries, Western, economy, Western economies sharply diverged from the rest of the world. Major powers like China, India, and Japan stagnated in this period and even declined. Explaining this divergence is the central riddle of Western civilization. Now, I'm sure you've seen the extraordinary variety of explanations that have been proffered for this divergence. The American environmentalist Jared Diamond has famously written at length that the West's success was completely due to its position on the globe. In this green age, history driven by geographical and environmental determinism is increasingly popular and influential. Other historians have offered Marxist and post-Marxist explanations that rest on military power or colonial conquest. In other words, the West won history because it only managed to suppress the rest of the world. Other explanations rely on technological change, population pressure, even bacteria. It's important to note that these are all explanations grounded on the material world. But too many are unsatisfactory because they start only halfway through the story. If Western civilization was skilled at invasion, why? If it was the most likely to innovate, as the technological determinists will suggest, why might that be the case? If it could handle plagues better, why? If it was even the most willing to subjugate foreign lands and people, why? As Duchesne points out, too many of these explanations, moreover, are empirically false. The seeds of Western supremacy were grown long before the rise of the West. The simple international GDP per capita data which historians have long relied on has now been supplanted by estimates of things like land and labor productivity, allowing modern historians to distinguish between economic growth in, say, China and Western Europe. And we now know that Western economies were more dynamic, more flexible, and embraced innovation more comprehensively than their competitors. Ultimately, Duchesne finds that the history of Western civilization is a history of ideas, first and foremost. Duchesne argues that there is a clear and unambiguous Western tradition, which is a restless tradition. This restlessness and the creativity it has sparked has translated into incomparable advances in the arts, philosophy, history, science, and yes, war making and empire building. This is, does nothing to delegitimize the successes of other civilizations across the world. 
but it is to emphasize the uniqueness and coherence of Western civilization that led to its rise in the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries. As David Hume wrote in 1754, the same age which produces great philosophers and politicians, renowned generals and poets, usually abounds with skilled weavers and ship carpenters. We cannot expect that a piece of woolen cloth will be wrought to perfection in a nation which is ignorant of astronomy or where ethics are neglected. To study Western civilization is to study the relationship between these two spheres of human activity, the production of ideas and how those ideas have influenced humans and the material world. Why Western civilization then? The Institute of Public Affairs spends a lot of time talking about concrete day-to-day -day public policy issues. We talk about, and, and you've seen us and read us talk about, the economics of emissions trading schemes, legal restrictions on free speech and the nanny state. But increasingly we found it hard to communicate to journalists and the political class about why some things are so objectionable. Why should things be objectionable to a Western liberal mindset? Why, for instance, is it a bad thing if the government forces traditionally men's only clubs to admit female members? And why shouldn't the government stop a women's only travel company being set up when it's quite obviously discriminatory? Obviously the answer to that is it would breach, breach the basic principle of free association. Increasingly we're finding the policy that policy disputes become not just debates about cost or effectiveness, but pivot on deep philosophical issues. Are our liberties given to us by government, or are governments just there to protect liberties we already have by virtue of being human? You can't answer that question without knowing or understanding where those liberties came from and how they were forged, and of course, why they matter. Those of us who believe in individual freedom, we're finding that we have to justify the very idea of rights like free association. But this idea that the state, not individuals, should decide who we associate with is a direct repudiation of the hundreds of years of work by philosophers and revolutionaries who placed individuals above government. This is one of the great achievements of Western civilization and its in intellectual achievement that deserves to be studied. And Australian students deserve to have it taught to them. Today you will hear from an extremely wide and I think extremely impressive group of speakers. They have a wide variety of philosophical, academic and vocational backgrounds. But their goal is to reintroduce Western civilization, its strengths and its origins into Australian public debate. I hope you enjoy the day.